Okay, tonight we're talking 14.7, extrema of two variable functions. When you see the word extrema, think maximum value or values, minimum value or values. Uh, so the goal is to find what we call the absolute extrema of a two input variable function um, over a restricted domain, as it turns out. And also to find the local, or some books call it the relative extrema, uh, using what's called the second derivative test, but it's the second derivative test uh, on steroids. Uh, so some definitions you need to know about. Let's start with definition number one. Suppose that a function f is defined on a closed bounded region R with, okay, f of x naught, y naught is less than or equal to f of x, y, which is less than or equal to f of x1, y1 for all x, y, and r. Okay, so it's important to realize that when I want to specify a particular input, I use either uh, a, b, or x naught, y naught, or x1, y1. And when x and y can vary, or the inputs can vary, I just use x and y. Okay, so what we're saying is if, e if the height value f of x, y is always bigger than the value of f with uh, a particular input x naught, y naught, and uh, bigger than or equal to, and always smaller than or equal to f with the particular, uh, or the height of f, if you want to think of it, with the particular input at x1, y1, um, then uh, we could say that f of x naught, y naught over this uh, restricted domain, then f of x naught, y naught is called the absolute minimum on R. And f of x1, y1 is called the absolute maximum of f on R. Okay? So what am I saying here? Well, okay. Closed bounded region. So when you think closed bounded region, think some region bounded by a closed curve in the xy plane. So the input values are only allowed from this region in R2. Okay? Inputs in here. And when we say closed, that means the border itself is included. Okay? So this blob, this closed curve border is included in our possible input points. Then what we're saying is if this inequality is true, for any x, y input inside this closed bounded region, then f of x naught, y naught is your uh, absolute minimum on that region. And f of x1, y1 is your absolute maximum on that region. All right, definition two. A function of two variables has a local maximum at a, b. Now, local, some books use relative. Relative equals local. A local maximum at AB, I switched from X naught to AB, X naught Y naught to AB, uh, I don't know why, I just did. If F of XY is less than or equal to F of AB for all points um, XY in an open disk this time with center AB. And what we mean by open is, just like an open interval doesn't include its endpoints, an open uh, disk or region doesn't include its boundary curve. So we're saying if you pick any x, y inside this disk and run it through the function and if uh, f of x, y, f of that x, y value turns out to be less than or equal to f of a, b for any x, y inside this disk, then, um, then we say that f of a, b uh, is a local max, or there is a local maximum at AB, and that local maximum is F of AB. The height value is F of AB. Um, and then similarly, uh, in definition number three, a function of two variables has a local minimum at AB if F of XY is bigger than or equal to F of AB. So the height that you get from inputting XY still comes from that open disk. From inputting XY into F is always bigger than or equal to F of AB, then uh, that means that there's a local minimum occurring at AB, and that local minimum is the height value of F at, evaluated at AB. Um, and so what's the analogy there? Well, in calculus one, here's how you would think of a local or relative maximum. The, the function could be very wiggly, right? And it could be very high over here, very low over here. 
but in this or at this point here it reaches a local maximum right even though it's higher over here and at this point right here it reaches a local minimum and what you can do then is if it is a local maximum that means you can fit in an open interval around the x value call it a or x naught or whatever uh, such that f of a is that local uh, maximum okay and so this open interval that doesn't include its endpoints is analogous to the open disk and then likewise over here you could fit a if this is say b or something or uh, i guess i don't want to use b i could use a1 and a2 um, you can fit an open interval around a2 such that f of a2 is a local minimum value in this in this region for any uh, x value inside this um, interval f of x will be uh, bigger than f of a2 the way I've drawn it here okay so what we just described in in two dimensions for two-dimensional services in direct analogy to what you learned about local or relative mins and maxes in uh, the calculus one case where you have one input variable okay and then definition number four a point a B is called a critical point of F if the partial of F with respect to X evaluated at a B equals zero and the partial of F with respect to Y evaluated at a B uh, also equals zero so F sub X equals zero evaluated at a B F sub Y equals zero evaluated at a B in other words the partial derivatives are equal to zero does that sound familiar Remember, it w for the calculus one function, if you had a, a, a local maximum at a point, then f prime of the x value that produces that maximum is equal to zero, and we call that value, that x value, a critical value. Remember that? Same idea here, except now it's with the point a, b. Okay. Um, uh, also, if, if one of these partials doesn't exist, we call it a critical value. Now, as you might imagine, relative maximums, relative minimums are going to occur at critical points. And you can see it best with the two-dimensional version. Why? Because the derivative here, the slope of the tangent line at a relative max or a relative min, what's the derivative? Well, it's equal to zero. Okay? And so the reason why a uh, relative max or relative min occurs at a critical point is because in calculus one, the tangent line goes horizontal there. In calculus three, it's going to be the tangent plane that goes horizontal. Okay? Um, now, critical points don't always correspond to relative extrema. But if you do have a relative extrema at a particular x and y value, then that x and y value will be a critical point if it's a relative extrema. Okay. The extreme value theorem uh, in calculus 3. So suppose f is, now remember, f is a function of two variables, x and y. So suppose f is a f continuous function, that's important, of two variables on a closed bounded region R in the xy plane. Then you are guaranteed that f takes on both an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum. Okay, this is hard to draw for a surface f, but you had an analogous theorem back in calculus one. So let's make the analogy. Let's suppose you have a continuous function uh, in the calculus one sense, a nice curve, right? Whoops, it's not a function anymore when it goes up and curves back on itself. So let me try it again. So you have this function here. There's f. It's a nice continuous function. And let's say you bound it by a closed, in this case, not region, but interval on the x-axis. So let's, uh, let's do this. Let's bound it, uh, say, here and here then you what this extreme value theorem says is you are guaranteed that this function on this interval will reach a maximum and minimum height so uh, first value could be x naught the second value could be x1 
Why are you guaranteed that? Well, I can't prove it by the picture, but it's a good indication. Look, if it's continuous, it has to reach a maximum height, at least the way, any way you can think of drawing it. And in this case, it looks like that maximum height is here, and it would correspond to some x value inside the interval, right? Or it could happen at an endpoint. It could be at a minimum at an endpoint, right? But it's going to happen. And the same thing will be true of a surface, as long as the domain is restricted to be a closed bounded region. Theorem 2, if f has a local maximum or minimum at, let's say, a point AB, and the first order partial derivatives of f exist, then those partials will equal zero. Okay, so the very important note. Note number one, although a critical point is not necessarily or does not necessarily correspond to a minimum or maximum function value, local extrema only occur at critical points. Do you understand the difference there? So just because you're given a critical point doesn't mean the function has a max or min when you plug in and evaluate the function at that critical point. But if you know that a critical point produces a local max or local min, then automatically the x and y value that produce that max and min is a critical point. Okay, so it works one way but not the other. All right, and then note number two, critical points of a function can also be defined as points in the domain for which the gradient is equal to zero or undefined. Does that make sense to you? You remember what the gradient was from last time? Del F would be the, uh, the partial of F with respect to X, evaluated at X, Y, or whatever the input is, I, plus F sub Y, the function F, uh, the derivative of the function F with respect to Y times J. Or if you com prefer uh, component form, it would be F sub X with whatever inputs are there f sub y, right? Then what are we really saying? We're really saying, when we say del f equals zero, we're really saying both components equal zero. So it's, it's just another way of saying the partial derivatives equal zero. Filling in zero for the partial derivatives in the tangent plane formula from 15.4 in, in uh, the updated version, it's actually 14.4 gives the equation z equals z not a horizontal tangent plane. Thus, the critical values of a function correspond to the points where the function's tangent plane is horizontal or do not exist. So here's what I'm saying there. The equation of the tangent plane that we gave you a bit ago looks like this. Well, if the partials are zero, in other words, if you've got yourself a relative max or min on the graph of f, then what we're saying is the partials are equal to zero, right? If the partials are equal to zero, then this whole right-hand side of this equation is equal to zero if the partials equal zero. So let me make that clear. Equals zero when del f is equal to zero, right? At, at x not, y not. Del f at x not, y not. So that means z minus z not equals zero or z equals z naught, which is a horizontal plane. So the only point I'm trying to make here is that the critical points correspond to horizontal tangent planes, and the horizontal tangent planes can correspond to relative maxes or min. In the same way, horizontal tangent lines corresponded to relative maxes or min back in Calc 1. So here we go. Let's talk about uh, actually finding the absolute extrema over the region uh, y equals x squared and y equals 4. And, and what I mean by this is the region bounded by these graphs. So let me show you a picture then. So what does the graph of y equal x squared look like? Parabola. It's a parabola. 
Something like that, right? What does the graph of y equal 4 look like? Horizontal line. Horizontal line at a height of 4, which is obviously going to intersect the parabola somewhere, right? In fact, where will it intersect? Well, I mean, just by guessing and checking, I think uh, if you plug in 2 in for x in the parabola, you get 4, right? So 2, 4, and also negative 2, 4, right? So, guys, I want to clear the region I'm talking about. The, so this is the domain that we're allowed to use then on f. The border given by the line and the parabola and its interior. So these two borders, y equals 4 and y equals x squared, create what? They create a closed bounded region for our domain. So what does that mean? Well, by the extreme value theorem, we are guaranteed that f is going to have an absolute maximum and an absolute minimum on this region. I don't care what's happening. The universe doesn't exist outside this region, okay? So I don't care what's happening outside this region. On this region, it'll have a max and a min, Abs and it, we'll call it an absolute max and an absolute min on this region. That's what the extreme value theorem says. Why? I mean, what about f guarantees that? besides the fact that we're defining it on a closed bounded region, F has to be what? Continuous. So I would say since F is a polynomial function, which means it's continuous, since F is a polynomial, and we know that all polynomials are continuous. I'll say all polys are continuous. We need that, if you look at the extreme value theorem, in order for it to work, the function has to be continuous, okay? If it's not continuous, then at the discontinuity, it could shoot up to infinity, right? And then there would be no, so the height values could shoot up to infinity, and then there would be no absolute max, would there? If it keeps getting taller. But that won't happen if it's continuous on a closed bounded region. Okay. So uh, how do we go about then finding the extrema. Well, it's very systematic. The first thing I would look for is interior critical values, okay? Critical values that aren't on the border defined by y equals x and y equals x squared. Um, interior uh, critical values or critical points. Let's call them CPs for short. Well, the interior critical values, hopefully it makes sense, will correspond to local extrema, right? And local extrema can be absolute extrema, but not necessarily. All right, so how are we going to find, any guesses on how we're going to find critical points corresponding to local extrema? Just based on your calculus one experience, what are we going to do? Yeah, except this time we're going to say derivatives, plural, derivatives. because we're going to set both partials equal to zero. Because if you've got a critical point and the partials exist, then those partials will equal zero at that critical point. Okay, so all right, let's find f sub x. Well, let's go back and show you the function. Actually, let me just rewrite the function. It was um, f equals 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y, just to remind you what it is. And it is f of xy, if you like. So what is the partial with respect to x? 6x, I heard it. And what is the partial of f with respect to y? 4y minus 4. Four. 4y four minus 4. And then what are we going to do to find the critical points then? Set them equal to 0. Now, hopefully you realize this could, in fact, well, I suppose it is, a system of two equations, two unknowns except both equations only contain one variable. Hopefully you realize that you could in fact get a system of two equations, two unknowns that you have to solve using the usual algebra techniques of elimination or substitution. Okay, this turned out to be particularly easy. Um, we'll find out, we'll look at a harder one later. Um, so, hmm, what does x have to equal? Zero. I'd say zero, yeah. So from this guy, x equals zero. This guy's a little bit harder. What does y equal? One. So your critical point, your interior critical point is just 0, 1. So let's circle that. We're going to need that, but we're not going to do anything with it yet. 
So just circle it for later. Okay. Now, next, we're going to find our boundary critical values because just like in Calculus 1, absolute extrema can very easily occur on the boundary. I mean, think about it. If, what if you had just a plane as your function slanted upwards? Then, I, at least on one part of the boundary, you'd get the maximum, right? And in one part, you'd get the minimum if it's just a plane slanted upward. So, yeah, you can definitely get critical um, values on the boundary. Okay, so note number two, uh, boundary. Um, let's use, uh, there's going to be two boundaries, right? Y equals four would be one of them. So if Y equals four, then the function becomes F of X comma four, doesn't it? So F of X comma four would equal 3x squared plus 2 times 4 squared minus 4 times 4. Everybody see what I'm doing there? Plug it in here, 4 there, and 4 there, right? And that's what the function becomes when y equals 4 on that line. So you're restricting x and y, va x and y input values to be on this line between negative 2 and positive two. Everybody see that? And that that's an interesting thing I just said. Maybe we should make that clear. When can y equal four? Well, when x is between negative two and two, right? So you always check the endpoints as well. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay. So what what does this guy turn out to be then? 3x squared, this is 32 minus 16, 16. So 3x squared plus 16. Now, if you think about it, this is just a parabola, isn't it? 3x squared plus 16 is just a parabola. So, I mean, you could take the derivative with respect to x and set it equal to 0 to find the critical point. Or you could just realize what the first corner of the vertex is. What's the first corner of the vertex of this parabola? Zero, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if you take the derivative and set it equal to zero, won't you get x equals zero? You'll get 6x equals zero, just x equals zero. Okay. So x equals zero, and then what's the y value? Four. Okay, you don't have to do anything to get it. Just look. Oh, yeah, it's, oh, oh, the y value is always 4 here. So your critical point then is 0, 4 on that line, right? y equals 4. But you should also check the endpoints. Also check x equals negative 2 and x equals 2. You always check it when you, especially when you get corners in your region, you always check those corners. Okay, uh, so what would be the corresponding y values when x is negative 2 and y is equal to 2, or x is negative 2 or x is positive 2? Still 4, isn't it? So negative 2, 4, positive 2, 4, or plus or minus 2, 4, if you like. So we've got three more critical values that we're going to need to look at later on. 0, 4, and plus or minus 2, 4. Okay, there's one more boundary we need to check. And that's uh, when uh, y equals x squared. Now again, just so we don't have to scroll up, the function is f of x, y equals 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. But what does this function become when we're restricting y values to be on the parabola? In other words, y has to equal x squared. F of 2y? Sure. So the function, let's see. The function becomes f of x, not 2y, but y squared, or x squared, rather. Right, because y is x squared. So all I'm doing is plugging that in right there. And that becomes, so the function becomes 3x squared plus 2x squared 
minus, uh, did I copy that down wrong? Yeah, this should have been y squared there. So this would be x squared squared. And then minus four times x squared. Did everybody see what I did? Okay. So what does this become then? What does the function become? Well, okay, 3x squared minus 4x squared on the ends would just be minus x squared, wouldn't it? And then 2x to the fourth, x squared squared, 2x squared squared, x to the fourth. Everybody agree with that? So essentially, do you see what we're getting then when we plug in uh, values on the border? We're getting a calculus one type function, aren't we, with a single input variable? Yeah. If you wanted to, you could call it g of x if it helps. So g of x is f of x comma x squared. So g of x is 2x to the fourth minus x squared. Now, how do we find the critical values of this calculus one type function? What did you do in calculus one? You had to do what? You had to take the derivative and set it equal to zero. zero. Same thing here. Because we turned it into a calculus one type function by restricting the, the y values to lie on y equals x squared. So what is g prime of x then? Um, 4x, or 2x. Oh, uh, careful. Um, skipping steps. 8x cubed minus 2x, and we set that equal to zero and you solve this equation. What's the best way to solve that equation? Well, how about factor? 2x, what's left? 4x squared minus 1. And then you set both factors equal to 0. 2x equals 0 or 4x squared minus 1 equals 0. Obviously, x would equal 0, or x would equal, well, x squared would be 1 fourth, right? So what would x equal? Plus or minus 1 half. Okay, what is the y value then when x equals 0? Keep it in mind, y equals x squared. What is the y value when x equals 0? Zero. Zero squared is zero. What is the y value? Again, y equals x squared. What is the y value when x equals plus or minus one half? It's one fourth. So you get two critical values here. Uh, plus or minus one half, one fourth. Okay, so let me circle all these guys. So I guess we've got three more critical values. Let me rewrite this one as just zero, zero t for consistency's sake. And then, so you've got three more critical values. So because we're dealing with a restricted domain, all we have to do to find the absolute max, absolute min, since the only possibilities lie at critical points, is plug all those critical points into the function. The function value that's the biggest is your absolute max. The function that value that's the smallest is your absolute min. And that's what we're exactly what we're going to do. Probably the best way to do that is to use a chart. So in this table, we'll have an x, y value. The x and y value will be the critical points. And then the f of x, y value tells us whether or not we've got an extrema. And if you go back and look, we've got critical point 0, 1, 0, 4, plus or minus 2, 4. 0, 0, and plus or minus 1 half, 1 fourth. So if we write all those down, now again, I'll remind you what our function is. It's uh, 3x squared plus 2y squared minus 4y. I won't do all, I'll just tell you what they are on most of them, but let's, just to show you what we're doing, if we plug in 0, 1, so f of 0, 1, how do you find that? Well, uh, zero, that becomes uh, zero right there. And then two minus four, negative two. So that's the function value for zero, one. And then you're plugging in all these values. I'm just going to tell you what you get. 
When you plug in x equals 0, y equals 4 into that function, you get 16. Negative 2, 4, you get 28. Notice you're going to get the same whether the x value is positive or negative. So in this particular case, I could have combined these, plus or minus 2, comma 4. But that's because there's a, a square on the x, right? If you had another function where you had an odd power or another piece to this function where you had an odd power on the x, then you'd have to separate it, which I did just, b just, for con just because you may have to do it anyway. So you will get 28 here as well. I think we can do 0, 0 without looking. What do you get if you plug in 0 for x, 0 for y, 0 for z? And then if you plug in 1 half and 1 fourth or negative 1 half and negative 1 fourth, you get negative 1 eighth, I think, both times. Okay, so scan the function values. Which one's the smallest? Negative 2, right? So there's your absolute minimum on that region. Which ones are the biggest? We've got two of them that are the same. 28. So these are your absolute maximums, or that maximum, I should say, occurs at two different critical points. So the second derivative test, the Calculus 3 version, I call it Theorem 3 here, the second derivative test, suppose the second partials of f are continuous on an open region. Oh, if the second partials are continuous, well, then the first partials are going to be continuous, and we're dealing with a nice, well-behaved function, right? Because if the first partials are continuous, then you know from 14.4 that the function is differentiable. And a function that, differ that is differentiable is not only continuous, but very well behaved. It's nice and smooth, no sharp edges or points, right? So the, this stuff only works for nice, nice functions. Um, okay, so suppose the second partials of f are continuous on an open region containing a, b I'm using as the input. And del f evaluated at a, b is equal to zero, which is just another way of saying a, b is a critical point of f, right? Now this mysterious thing which we call d, which is basically the second derivative of f, evaluated both times at x, evaluated at a, b, times the second derivative of f, evaluated both times at y, evaluated at a, b, minus the mixed partial squared evaluated at a, b, that value, if that's bigger than zero, then the function will have a local max, a relative max, or a relative min, one of the two, okay? So it's critical to get a, a good result here as far as having an extrema, it's critical that d be greater than zero. And then if the second derivative of f sub x x evaluated at a, b is greater than zero, then that actually corresponds to a local minimum. And if the second derivative uh, uh, f sub x x evaluated at a, b is less than zero, then you actually get f of a, b is actually a local maximum. And if you think about it, that corresponds exactly with what happened with the second derivative test in calculus one, right? When uh, you took f double prime evaluated at, say, a critical value a, and you got that that was less than zero, then what does that mean? That means it's concave um, down, right? Concave down. And so that A value has got to correspond with a maximum, right? Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what's happening here. When we have a less than here, we get a local maximum, okay? Or the opposite is true. If it's greater than zero, you get a local minimum, okay? If d is less than zero, then f of a, b turns out to be a saddle point. So it's neither a max nor a min, and we call it a saddle point because if you think of a, a hyperbolic paraboloid, remember it looks kind of like a saddle shape. If you think of the hyperbolic paraboloid, then this point right here on the hyperbolic paraboloid is a saddle point. Uh, it corresponds to 
a horizontal tangent plane, doesn't it? I mean, you could even see the horizontal tangent plane almost, couldn't you? Um, but of course, it's not going to correspond to a, a local min or local max. And then the test is inconclusive if d equals zero. So right now, you might be wondering where this mysterious d comes from. I'm not going to prove the second derivative test to you, but I'll give you an indication of how the proof works. If you uh, take a function, f of x, y, it graphs, as you know, to be a surface, right? And so that, this is how I like to draw my, my surfaces. So this is z equals f of x, y. And uh, let's say you have a direction vector. And I'm going to put the end point of that, the tail of that direction vector, we'll call it u, right underneath what might be the local maximum in this case, right? And then if you think of the line that goes through u, since I placed the u, so this point right here would be your a, b, and I'm placing u, the tail of u right there. Now, if you think of a line that coincides with u cutting through the surface, then you might get a curve. Maybe it wiggles a little bit. Goes. So uh, think about the line that cuts through you. It coincides with you and cuts through the surface. It creates this black cross-sectional curve, right? And if you think about this curve, this is a calculus one type curve. And this point right here, which is a, a local maximum on the surface, would also be a local maximum on that curve. So what you do is, given the restriction, based on whatever this line is, uh, whatever, you know, you could come up with um, uh, the equations, the generic equations of that line like we did last time when talking about the, uh, the directional derivative. What you could do then is restrict the domain of f to lie on this line. You get then this curve for f, which is a calculus one type curve, and then you take its second derivative based on uh, the directional derivative formula uh, for the first derivative, and then you take the derivative of that. And um, you use the regular uh, uh, second derivative test from calculus one, then to show that a uh, relative max occurs at this point a b but if you do it generically for any direction vector u once you take the second derivative and show that you get a local maximum there you've shown it for all such u and you've proved the theorem in this one we're going to find the local max or local min if it exists find the local max let's just change it to extrema and I don't have to write both here we go f of x y is equal to x plus y so far pretty easy plus 1 divided by x times y and I'm gonna give you the restriction that both x and y are greater than 0 in many applications, you'll have restrictions like that. X and Y often have to be bigger than zero. Okay. Um, well, according to, if we want to use the second derivative test, we'd better find a critical value first, right? So how do we do that? Set the first derivative equal to zero. Eh, what do you mean by the first derivative? The second derivative? Well... How about the partial? You were right. All you needed to change the word was to partial, yeah. So let's find the partial of f with respect to x. So what's that going to be? Let's see. For this first term, what's the derivative of x with respect to x? 1. Derivative of y with respect to x? 0. The derivative of 1 over x times y with respect to x? Plus or minus? So minus 1 over, did I hear x squared y? Okay. Does everybody agree with that? You guys see y? Do you need explanation? 
because you can think of 1 over x, y as x to the negative 1 over y, right? Take the derivative of that. I don't know if prime notation is appropriate here since it's a, we have to specify which, which variable we take the derivative with respect to. But um, a more appropriate notation would be uh, d dx. If you take the derivative of that with respect to x, then the power rule says we bring down the negative 1 and then subtract 1 from the exponent. And of course, that's the same as negative 1 over x squared times the y that's already there, right? OK. So what about um, the partial with respect to y? Partial of f with respect to y. Similar, but it's going to be 1. This one, uh, derivative of x with respect to y will be 0. Derivative of y with respect to y will be 1. What's the derivative of 1 over x times y with respect to y this time? Minus 1 over x, y squared. Everybody agree with that? Now, the par in order to find a critical point, if that critical point is going to correspond to a, a relative extremum, or if it is to be a critical point, then the first uh, derivatives there have to be, or the partial derivatives there have to be zero. So you create this system of equations, don't you? A little more difficult than the one we looked at in the first example. It's not as bad as you might think, though. You have to be a little creative when solving nonlinear systems of equations. Um, but look, w would you agree with this statement? that 1 over x squared y would have to equal 1 over x y squared based on those two equations? Does everybody see that? So I could offer a little explanation <coughs> off to the side here. Um, if you set both of these equations equal to 1, in other words, brought the minus 1 over x y squared over to the other side, you'd get 1 over x y, x squared y, I should have said, equals 1, right? So bring this guy to the right side by adding it, turning the equation around, you get this. Bring 1 over xy squared minus 1 over xy squared to the other side by adding it, turning it around, you get 1 over xy squared equals 1. So if they both equal 1, they're equal to each other. So that's how I got that statement. Does that make sense? All right. Now, can't I just simply cross multiply here? And then, or just think of it as if, if you have one on top, then the denominators must be equal, however you think of it. You should come up with x squared. Let me just stay with green here. You should come up with x squared y equals x y squared. Right? Now, it's a good habit to get into to factor equations like this, set equal to zero and factor. This one is not totally necessary because we know x and y aren't zero, but it's a good habit to get into. Set it equal to zero. Bring, I'm going to bring the x, y squared over to the other side by subtracting it. And then factor out. What, what do you factor out? What's the common factor? They both have an x and a y in common. So well then what's left from the first factor? If you factor out an x times y, just x, right? If you factor out an x times y, from the second factor, what's left? Just minus y equals 0. Normally, you would set both factors, or all factors, equal to 0, right? But is, uh, are x and y allowed to be 0, either one? No. So I'm only worried about the non-zero one. So from the x minus y factor, I set that guy equal to 0, which means? Yeah, x has to equal y or y equals x. That's not so bad, but we actually need to get numerical values, right? So how do we get numerical values here? What would have to be true if, if x were to equal y? So I'm, I'm going back, I'm looking at uh, these equations, I guess, over here in blue. How, how could this be true? How could one of these be true? Suppose they're equal then. What does this become? 
1 over x cubed equals 1, or x cubed equals 1, right? Or x equals 1, which means y equals 1. There's our critical point. So it takes a, a little bit of creativity to come up with these critical points. This is your CP. And as you'll find, especially in the next section, you got to get a little clever with some of these systems of equations that we end up with. Um, all right, so, so what? Well, the first derivative test w says we need to find this quantity D. D, remember, is F sub X evaluated at the critical point or points. I mean, you, you take one critical point at a time, though. Um, times F sub Y, Y evaluated at the critical point minus the mixed partial f of x, uh, f sub x, y evaluated at the critical point, then you square it. And we need that to be bigger than zero for the second derivative test to tell us anything. Okay, so I, I went down a little too fast there. If you look, uh, what would the, well, we need to compute all these things, don't we? So what would the, second derivative with respect to x, b. So I think it'd be easier if I just had these right in front of us. I think it'd be easier to calculate these things. So we, we're going to need to plug into this thing. So keep that in mind. But we need to calculate these other derivatives. Okay. So from what we have here, this is the first derivative with respect to x. Let's find the second derivative with respect to x. So take the derivative of this guy. What are you going to get? And when I don't put in the, uh, the uh, function notation, I mean the inputs are x and y. So I'm finding the formula for f sub x, x. So what would we get when we take the derivative of f sub x with respect to x, essentially? What do you think? Positive 2 over x cubed times y. Everybody agree with that? So yeah, I mean, again, you could write this as x to the negative 2 in the numerator if it helps, and then use the power rule on that. You can see you'll get a positive when you bring down the negative 2. OK. Um, and then what would f sub y, y be? So you look at this guy. Well, this guy is 0, right, when you take the derivative with respect to y. What do you get with this guy? Is it going to be positive 2 again over this times x, y, q? Everybody agree with that? <coughs> and then finally, the mixed partial, f sub x, y. So just go back, look at f sub x. Take the derivative of this guy with respect to y. This whole thing, but of course, the, one, the derivative of the 1 is 0 with respect to y. So take the derivative of this with respect to y. What do you get? Will it be positive or negative? Think of having a y to the negative 1 in the exponent. You bring down the negative 1, makes it positive. So what do you get? Uh, 1 over x, y squared. Would you buy that? OK. Now, if you evaluate these, so let me see if I can squeeze it in here. Eval at, what was the critical value, critical point? 1, 1. What do we get? Just 2, what do we get for this guy? Evaluated at 1, 1. 2, and for this guy? Plug 1 in for x, 1 in for y, you get 1. Agreed? OK. So then you go back up. If you plug in for d, you get, does everybody see you get 2 times 2 minus, well, 1 squared. So yeah, here, inside the parentheses, I'm plugging in 1. You squared. In this case, it doesn't make a difference. You get 4 minus 1, which is 3. So d, in this case, is 4 minus 1, which is 3. Is that bigger than 0? Last time I looked. So we're in business. That critical point is going to correspond to either a uh, a local min or a local max. Then you just apply the, 
the uh, second derivative test to f sub xx, it works for that. Works for f sub yy as well, but we don't state it in terms of that. And then um, determine whether or not uh, you, you get a local min or max there. So um, what did we get? We got that f sub xx evaluated at 1, 1 was 2, which is bigger than 0, right? We should probably make that statement. So f sub xx evaluated at 1, 1, we decided was 2, which is bigger than 0, which means the original function f of 1, 1, um, which equals, what, what does that equal? So the original function was this guy. If you plug 1 in for x and y, you're going to get 3, right? So 3, f of 1, 1 equals 3 will be what? Since we got this relationship, think of the second derivative. You don't need to look at what I wrote earlier. Think of the second derivative test from calculus 1. When the second derivative is bigger than 0, what are you dealing with? A local max or a local min? Min. So this value is the local minimum height, right? So I'll say it this way, which means f of 1, 1 is a local minimum. After you find d, you just have to remember what the second derivative test tells you from calc 1 in terms of f sub xx.